Welcome to Big Trends Monthly. I'm Josh Brown. I'm here with JC Peretz of All Star Charts to break down the monthly closing candlestick charts to reveal the most meaningful market moves around the world. Candlestick charting originated in the 1700s as speculators in the rice markets of feudal Japan saw the advantage of visualizing the four most important prices of each day, opening, closing, high, and low. As each month comes to an end, every investable asset class produces a new candle on its monthly chart. These are the most notable monthly candles and the stories behind them. Let's go right to JC. The first chart we're starting with, which I think makes sense, is the S&P 500. What are we looking at here? Well, first of all, nice introduction there on the Japanese candlesticks. I appreciate I working, that. I was working on that uh, last night. so I Yeah, yeah. Like I'm surprised that. you didn't call me ahead of time. So what year? So yeah, Monahisa Homa, this guy, he was the man. He's a, he, they say that there's never been a rich technician. This dude was a, an honorary samurai in the 1700s because yeah. he was such a badass. You know what I mean? Well, Come on. So in, in, in Shogunate, Japan, you had rice markets in different provinces, but anybody could buy or sell at any price they wanted to and had no knowledge of what was happening even a few villages over. And I think this was the first attempt to get market data from all over uh, the country and try to figure something out about it, uh, about supply or demand. So it's not magic. It's this is what happened in the market in the morning. This is what happened at sundown. This was the highest prices were at this day. And this was the lowest. So that's, yeah. I think... I think it's like very elemental, but people tend to think about candlesticks and they, they say, oh, what is that? Well, it's opening and closing. Like what, what, if you were looking at an illustrative version of the market's activity for a day or a week or a month, what else would you want to know, right? Okay. It's just so, it's just a way to visualize data. Listen, we could look at bar charts, but candlestick charts tell more of a story. I mean, it's really uh, all it is. Um, so that's what we're doing. And then what I love about monthly candlesticks specifically, and I get made fun of because I get all excited every month, is that it forces us. It forces us to take a step back and identify the direction of the primary trend. Because there's only one data point each month, we're only going through this process 12 times a year. It might take me 30 to 45 minutes each month. So think about it. That's going to be nine, 10 hours of work a year. And it's the best 10 hours of work I put in the whole year. No question. Well, that's, that's why we're starting this show. I totally agree with all that. So tell me about your first chart. So we're looking at the S&P 500. Listen, there's a million trend following systems out there. You know, I think this is a, a really easy, simple one. I know you guys probably use some sort of variation of this. All we're looking at is a 10-month exponential moving average. You could look at a 10-month simple moving average. And basically, the way the strategy works is if we close above that moving average, that 10-month moving average, we own the S&P 500. And if we close below it, we don't. Or we buy bonds instead. That's just like an old school, keep it simple, stupid, trend-following system that is not perfect. It's not going to get you out at the top. It's not going to get you in at the bottom, but it's going to let you get big chunks. And then more importantly, most importantly, I think, if this just inspires you to build your own trend following system that's better than this, I promise you, you'll find a better one. This can at the very least be a good starting point. By definition, it obviously can't pick tops and bottoms because um, the top on a monthly candlestick, a market top will occur within that month so you'll have to wait till the next candlesticks for the next month or, or even available to look at and the same with the bottom so so we know that you're using an exponential as opposed to a simple because the exponential puts more weight on more recent months so it's using more recent information um in, in a way that the simple doesn't quite capture and at the end of the day, it doesn't really change it that much. Um, right. I use a simple, I use an exponential. We, I mean, the truth is we have both on our workbook. So we look at both and we do the same thing for the NASDAQ. Um, but I think this just reiterates that we're not in a downtrend, right? We're in an uptrend. Stocks are making new highs, more stocks, more sectors, more indexes around the globe are making new highs. That's an expansion in participation. When we look back in history and we've done the work, when stocks are making new all-time highs, that tends to happen in an environment that we're being rewarded for buying stocks versus selling them. Right. Um, let's move on to the next one. You're saying everything was higher 
last month except the U.S. dollar. Why, yep. why do investors, financial advisors, asset managers, why does everyone have to pay attention to the dollar when they think about the stock market? Why is that important? Listen, it's the currency. It's the, the global denomination. I mean, everybody is in dollars. I mean, that's just what it is. And I know we've argued about this for decades, probably you and I, but you're short the dollar by, if, you know, if something you own is priced in dollars, you're by definition, you're short the dollars, the denominator in your fraction. And what's interesting is, so here, what we're looking at is we're on the X axis. We are uh, looking at the drawdown from the new 52 week high. So everything that's on the left, all the way on the left, is at a new all-time high, right? Bonds, growth, right? Tips, gold, euro, Aussie, they're all basically at new highs. In the Y-axis, you're looking at the percentage for the month. And let me draw your attention to the Dow Jones transportation average in the upper right. Why is it in the upper right? Because it's the, you know one of the furthest from making a new 52-week high, but it was actually the best performing sector. So that's part of that sector rotation story. Look at emerging markets, look at gold, look at copper. Don't all of those things remind you of things that do well when the dollar's falling? And then look at the lonely dollar down below. I think this, this scatter really tells us the story of am what reading, happened last month. Am I reading this right? Um, the dollar is the sole major asset class slash sector um, to have a loss in the month of July of everything that you follow around the globe. Yeah, pretty much. And a lot of things were up as a function of the dollar week, right? We can argue gold, copper, e emerging e markets, M. all those sure. things, right? Okay. Um, the next chart, you're looking at three different sectors. Uh, tell me why we're looking at the discretionary sector in the S&P 500 versus the healthcare sector versus communications. Why is this meaningful to you? Right, because some dictator who created this show said, I'm only allowed to have five charts. So this is our way of getting three and one. See how we see what we did there? So this really is, is, is getting back to that conversation of breath expansion. When people are like, well, JC, what's it going to take for you to get bearish? Well, fewer stocks making new highs, fewer sectors making new highs, fewer indexes, right? We're seeing right. the opposite. Um, what are we seeing? We're seeing discretionaries breaking out to new all-time highs coming out of a seven-month base, six, seven-month base. Same thing with healthcare, same thing with communications. All that saying is it's answering the question. When you and I are sitting down chatting and you say, and we say rhetorically, hey, are more sectors making new highs or are they are fewer sectors making new highs? This chart essentially answers that question we're getting more. I mean, materials right, so what are if, pushing up against new highs for God's what sake. What if I'm a what if I'm a bear and I look at your your charts and I say, okay, it's cute. You're saying XLY consumer discretionary sector. That's mostly Amazon. Okay, you're saying communications. We know that's Google and Facebook. Like, you're basically talking about a handful of mega cap stocks in those sectors deciding the the stock the sector's direction. And quite frankly, I think those stocks are miscategorized anyway. I don't know why Amazon's a consumer discretionary. Like, what do you say to people that do that? I say open your eyes because that's the way the world works. And, you know, we're jaded here in America because, like, our biggest, you know, what is it? Discretionary is the one with the biggest stock with uh, Amazon, maybe Facebook and Google as part of communications. Guess what? Every other country in the world is like 10 times worse. You just see India, the energy sector, half of it is one stock is reliance. So like, okay. that's just the way the world works. Just deal with it. The fact that it's less so in America um, is what you should be pointing out. It's way more obnoxious around the world, number one. Number two, as my friend Todd Sohn likes to say over at Stratege, is your best players are supposed to score most of your points, right? If LeBron was like the sixth man, right, uh, you know, wasn't leading in points and assists and boards and all that stuff, like something would be wrong. Like LeBron's right. supposed to be your stud, right? Um, it's right. the same thing in the market. Go back in history. This is perfectly normal. Yeah, there've always been big. There've always been outsized winners in every bull market. I agree. Yeah. So anybody um, who says that is just lazy. Hasn't done the homework. So are more S and P five hundred sectors then uh, making new highs than in the month of June? Like with um, July and improvement. On a closing basis, I think so. I, I got to go back and do the math. I'd say probably. Um, but it's, it's, we're not seeing fewer. It's either the same or a little bit more. We're not seeing deterioration. And then also, I mean, I, I know this is about monthly charts, 
but we're not making new 52 week highs yet in most of the indexes. So to right. be looking at the new 52 week high list, I think is like looking at the snow report in the summer. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think we want to be looking at the 126 day high list, the 63 day high list, the 21 day high list, right? So 21 days, about a month, 63 days, about a quarter, 126, about six months. So those are business. Those are trading. Those are trading days. Yeah. So 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 twenty one trading days in in a in a in a thirty day month. Ballpark. Um, right. And then ultimately, those that breath expansion will show up on the new fifty two week high list. But breath doesn't go straight to new fifty two week highs, right? And I think people forget that. So we're seeing expansion in breath on shorter time frames, which after the biggest crash like ever is what we need to focus on, not new fifty two week highs. Okay. Let's talk about your yield chart. So you're showing us the 10-year Treasury yield versus the 30-year Treasury yield, both of which made all-time lows during the course of July. Um, what, what is it about this particular, because uh, this is in candlesticks, but I know this is meaningful. So what is it about this chart that you wanted to show to us? I mean, listen, all-time lows, I don't care what we're talking about um, is, is meaningful. I mean, for the most part, if it's a little stock nobody cares about, fine, I don't care. But like, Listen, man, 30s and 10s are still making new lows. Bonds are making all-time highs. So is gold. So you were asking me, if I'm a bear, um, what should I say about the discretionary? Remember, you asked me that. Forget all that. If you're a bear, this is the chart that you're you know, jumping up and down about. Why is the market continuing to flow into bonds and gold at such an aggressive pace? In other words, if in other words are so what? Well? Right, if the recovery is so strong, why is the bond market saying the exact opposite? Or has the bond market lost that ability to signal um, economic strength or weakness because of liquidity conditions around the world and what central banks are doing, which is my, has been my argument for 10 years. Um, okay, let's go into this uh, Sienna and then Sienna versus the S&P 500. What was notable about this stock dur during uh, the last month? Listen, I think that this just goes back to our process. It's very top-down oriented. We start with the global macro, but at the end of the day, the, the goal is to make money, right? Give the people what they want, JC. They want to trade, you know? So I think this is interesting. You know, this is a big monster base. You know, uh, Edwards and McGee called this a saucer bottom. Big, big monster bases with explosive resolutions. It You show this to my boys and they're like, man, look at that base. Like, that just gets us excited. The bigger the base, the higher in space. That's how Luis Yamada taught us, right, Josh? Right. So Sienna is like a telecom technology provider, and it's indicative of many stocks that when, when you see this pattern shaping up, you take notice. And not Are to there... mention the relative strength, right? There's wisdom in relative strength. That's evidence of institutional accumulation. So that big base in relative strength combined with the base on an absolute basis to me suggests we want to err on the aggressively long side. And when you see these bases that last two decades, the upside resolution tends to be a lot more dramatic, a lot more explosive and can last a lot longer than even, we, you know, it, they usually exceed our expectations. So while I think it could go to 90, I think this could be a two or three bagger. Uh, we want to be long if we're above 57, flat below it, long only above 57. So I was trading this stock when I was 20 years old or something. <laughs> I uh, bet you were. And, and I remember it had a massive rally toward the end of the dot-com bubble uh, with all the telecom plays. And Sienna was like, at, for, it had its moment. It was like the hottest stock on the planet. Um, all right. You wanted to include this Bitcoin monthly candlestick chart. Um, and you seem to be very adamant about it. So I can't wait to hear why. Because I get asked about this stupid cryptocurrency like every day, right? Like every day. And I'm like, wait till it breaks 10,000. Wait till it breaks. 10. JC, right, so I, here you go. There you go. You got it. All right. Um, you know, it, this is like deja vu all over again to quote the great philosopher Yogi Berra. I feel like we've seen this story before. Uh, we've seen the upside resolutions. The long-term trend is up, obviously. So consolidations tend to resolve in the direction of the underlying trend, which is obviously exactly what's happening here. Uh, Ethereum breaking out, Bitcoin breaking out. I think it's their turn again. Okay, so is Bitcoin moving up as a function of what's happening with gold and silver and the U.S. dollar? Uh, or I know it doesn't matter as much to you, 
Um, but there is a lot of correlation there, at least lately, right? No. Well, if you divide the annual GDP by the unemployment rate, right, and then you multiply <laughs> by the PE ratio. No. All right. I don't you know anything it. about that stuff. I know the trend is up. They're buying it. If it's above 10000 and you want to own it, um, we do. We like it. I think it goes to 13000 first. Uh, then I think we see new all-time highs. I guess I was asking that question because we didn't get to gold. But they both seem they both seem to have a similar fan base, and that fan base for in both cases believes that the dollar is is facing imminent demise. So it would make sense for them to snap to a tighter correlation on the way up, and that's in fact what happened in the month of July. New all time high in gold, uh, not on on a nominal basis, price in dollars, and uh, Bitcoin now. I guess this is a two year high or two and a half year high, something like that? Something like that, not, not quite that long, but definitely new, definitely new highs and it looks like it's breaking out of this base. Whether it has something to do with gold or the dollar, I don't know about all that, maybe, um, but I think that matters less and what matters more is that the trend is up and especially if we're above 10,000. Listen, if we're below 10,000, leave it alone. It, 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 it paid handsomely to leave it alone for so long. Uh, and and we, we got what we've been waiting for. And Ethereum is breaking out too. Think of Ethereum as like the silver, Bitcoin as the gold. Look at it like that. And you're seeing a similar dynamic in precious metals with silver also outperforming gold. Sort of the little crazy little cousin, higher beta, tends to outperform on the way up and tends to get slaughtered when they're getting, when right. they're getting sold off, right? It's like if, go, if, if gold's not enough for you, may I introduce you to silver? And if silver's not enough... Here's right. Here's the BTC. All right, right. listen, you're the you're the man. You're gonna come back in the first week of September and tell us what's going on with the August candlesticks, right? Whatever you want. All right. And where do you want people to find your stuff? Allstarcharts.com. I get the emails. They're amazing. I read them all. Um, is that the best way for people to find find out more about your work and how you uh, provide it, research and information? Yeah, you know, go to All Star Charts on Twitter, Stock Twitch, YouTube, Instagram. I'm easy to find. And if you want our monthly chart book, uh, there's about a hundred and some charts on it. Happy to send it to uh, JV's audience. So just email candles at allstarcharts.com and I'll send you the PDF with uh, all of this one's candles. All right, we'll throw up the links in, in, in the notes for the show uh, so people can find that. All right, thank you so much, JC. Guys, let us know what you think. Are you looking at monthly candlesticks? If not, how do you know what the trends are? Like, what's your methodology? I'm not sure what else you, you would be doing. So um, let us know what your thoughts are, though. We're very interested. Go ahead and give us a like. If you like what we were talking about today, subscribe to the channel. Check out JC's allstarcharts.com. And we will be back first week of September for another edition of Big Trends Monthly.